Namaste. Welcome to the next session of Chatty Dad. Today we are going to be talking about digital transformation in FMCG and retail in India. As we go along, we obviously will be talking about organized retail and FMCG. What really happens in digital transformation? What do you really need? We perhaps will not be talking about what digital transformation itself is, but the complexities therein, the people view, people angle of that. As we do, allow me to introduce our speakers today. Vijay Kumar, Vijay I have known for maybe the last 10, 10, 12 years now from a retail uh, digital meet. He is a founder and CEO of InSales.in. He's a technologist, does training, does consulting in retail, does technology, all, all together. Amrita Asrani, she is the global brand marketing director for Fabric Care for Racket Ben Kaiser. Long stints in FMCG, long stints in marketing. Expect her to be talking about FMCG as related to organized sector, large corporates, and give us a sense of that. Vivek Bhatnagar has been in FMCG for the longest time, I think most of his career, except one time that he did deal with agri retail. But besides that, he has been an FMCG guy even today. That's what he does. He is vice president of sales and supply chain for Well Hygiene. Raj is the founder CEO of Indus Bloom. His company, besides other retail IT services stuff, they specialize in analytics. That's what we would love, love to hear from him. Finally, Madhavita. Madhavita Mohanty, she's a long time retail consultant, also is an educator. She teaches about retail, teaches to actual retail people. So welcome all. We are ready to go. Maybe Thank what you. we should start start with in the in the way we have seen digital transformation happening, especially in India, in many of the other sectors, we have seen fintech, for example, going leaps and strength like anywhere else in the world as well. However, my sense from being a retail strategy consultant, that's what my company Trinidad, we see the uptick to be slightly lower. Madhavita, maybe we could start with you. If I were to uh look at digital transformation in Indian uh, retail per se. Let me divide it into two parts. One is your family run or family owned businesses and the other is large corporates. Now, uh, while it would be very easy for me to generalize saying that this is how it happens in family run businesses and this is how it happens in uh, corporate and professionally run organizations, at the heart of digital tra transformation lies the intent and intent comes from people. So it finally boils down to the core of how serious, how dedicated are the people who are taking the decisions. So there is that bit of a gap between the decision makers and the executors. So I don't really uh, want to generalize, but from my experience, what I have seen is that if I were to look at a family run businesses, generalization would be that cool old world and would be a little slow on the uptick to digital uh, adaptation. But what I have been seeing across FMCG uh, businesses where the second generation, most of these I have, I interact with FMCG uh, companies, big, small, medium size across uh, the last 20, 22 years. What I have seen is that uh, the second generation are all educated in Harvard and the likes, and they are the ones who are driving faster adaptation to technology and digital transformation in their organizations. And similar case is seen in retail organizations as well. It's the second generation which has taken over the helm across, you name any large retail organization today, it's the second generation which is kind of the air in waiting or already taken over. So finally, it depends on how serious they are about driving these changes. I thought that I would share with all of you the view from inside the company. And since I've had a really long exposure to working and I've spent largest part of my career in a very organized American multinational company, then I've run a startup and then I also now work in a PE bag, fast growing owner led uh, FMCG company. So I have had different sorts of experiences and I must share with you that when I started out in my career, that was in Gillag, those days, we used to have information all coming in bits and pieces of paper. Pen and paper used to be the way the people went to the market and collected orders and, you know, you got them in. And I was just to build a contrast, I was doing some numbers to see what are the kind of, what's the level of information or data pieces that people connect today when they use a Salesforce automation. If, if a salesman goes to the market with 100 SKUs in his bag and works for about 24 days, doing 35 outlets a day, he gets about 85,000 uh, data points a month. 
yes, no, order taken or no, uh, order given or not given. For 500 salesmen, this is about 40 odd million pieces of data, which is about half a billion in a year. So in a year, this is the kind of uh, data points that today's companies are generating. And this data, when analyzed, it actually helps us understand the buying trends, the stocking trends, the offtake trends for over 200,000 outlets that we might be covering. So that's the level of change that I have seen occurring in my in the last two and a half decades. What I think is that if we generate all this data and this, like I said, that, you know, half a billion bits of data that come in every year and we don't analyze it. To me, it feels that we run 90 meters out of one in a hundred meters race and we stop. What's the point? Another 10 meters and we would have got, we would have breasted the finishing tape. So therefore, analyzing data is super important to draw insights from it. And that adds so much value in today's FMCG businesses. So that's the view from inside that I wanted to share. Thanks, thanks, Vivek and Madhita. I think very interesting perspectives. I just want to add on uh, by talking a little bit about, uh, as we all know, we've been experiencing that, you know, COVID today, uh, COVID the C that we all are afraid of, actually stands for, it's a metaphor for change, which is another C that the human, you know, I would say mind is extremely afraid of. And digital transformation as, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, there's no C there, but transformation is change. So uh, there is a lot of similarity, you know, how the human mind really reacts to change, accepts change, and then is willing to make the change. And I feel that's where the crux is of this whole story of digital transformation, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, companies, brands that have been in existence for a long period of time. And um, as we all know, the FMCG industry uh, over the last, say, 50 years uh, enjoyed undeniable success, you know, and grew total return to shareholders almost to the tune of 15% per year, which was, you know, performance, which was superb, second only to the materials industry. But that business model today, we see has, you know, sort of is not doing the same kind of returns, whether you talk about line, top line, obviously we know all the pressures. And uh, that's where everyone wants to adopt digital transformation. But what's coming in the way? It's because, you know, we as humans, we as people, as employees, uh, as consumers, all of us are a bit resistant to change. And that's what COVID is telling us that we need to, we have to, that's the way to survival. And the same goes with brands, the same goes with consumers as well. So uh, I feel that, you know, this whole gap between the, the ability to accept uh, is more of a phenomena because on one hand, uh, there are these tried and tested methods that we all know about. And on the other hand, you have these agile startups who are disrupting everything in the FMCG and the retail space. And in fact, uh, not just that, you know, you just look at, uh, for that matter, uh, what Amazon is doing, say, with climate pledge friendly. Now, that's a fantastic example of a retailer which has very quickly adapted and, and it has made it mandatory for all FMCG players that you have to change your you know, packaging requirements. You have to ensure sustainability along with digital transformation. And that's making companies you know, do their bit, uh, relook at the entire supply chain, relook at how digital and sustainability can be incorporated as part of this whole uh, value chain. But I think what's very important is that this should actually come from large brands. This should come from large houses. This should come from the other way around rather than it actually being enforced upon. And that's where, you know, the whole, uh, I would say this whole digital transformation piece is 70% about culture, about ways of working and how we need to transform and accept that change because digital transformation is only 30% about technology. The rest is all about people, the culture. And that's what is inhibiting, you know, this this quicker adoption. But of course, the the, the people who are entering, uh, you know, like at the entry level, when we look at whether it's management trainees or when we look at the young minds of today, they are the ones to accelerate this. We also have a lot of senior leadership mandates, which are making it uh, extremely essential to participate in this change. But it's the it's the center, you know, basically the, the ones in between the senior leadership and 
the younger ones who join today who also need to adapt to this change. That, uh, I think there are a bunch of points which I would love to pick up as we go along and uh, ask pointed questions as well. And let me throw this back to maybe Raj and then Vijay can have a go. Sure. Thanks, uh, Suhash. And it's a brilliant introduction by Madhu, Amrita and Vivek, touching broadly about how the organized and the unorganized work and how the generation is actually changing, which is also driving this. And right. So if you take a step back and look at the context of India, there are two pieces of the puzzle we are discussing today. One is the consumer brands, more specifically about the FMCG. So remaining piece of the uh, consumer brands other than FMCG are consumer durables and others. So if you leave focus on that, focus primarily on the FMCG brands, right? Like Amrita said, it's a brilliant run of return on capital they were able to uh, enjoy and also shareholder returns, the total shareholder returns they're able to deliver over a long period of time. And even as we speak today, they are one of the darlings of the market uh, in terms of the picks. So the, this uh, consumer or FMCG brands are a little away from the consumer, right? If let's say I eat a Kit Kat, Nestle doesn't know that I am the consumer for a particular flavor of Kit Kat, right? Or I use a particular detergent from Amway or somebody else, the company, unless it's directly sold, they wouldn't really know that I am a consumer, right? But they enjoy obviously a much bigger profit pool and they have the entire wherewithal and have an expanding scope of how they manage data. But if you look at the other piece of the side, which is the retailers, uh, there are a lot of data points they live on. Typically, if you look at an FMCG brand in India, they have anything about 500 to 2000 SKUs, uh, any large FMCG players in India. So, so many SKUs uh, in the route to market, so many different channel players, the stock is super stockist and the eventual outlets. Uh, almost none of the players in India reach to all the outlets. So that's a level of data they could actually combine together and do many things which they're already doing. And there is a lot of headroom in terms of what they could do in terms of uh, furthering their growth agenda and also driving a product availability at the outlet. So if you are a brand, uh, the growth will be enabled only when the product is available at the outlet when you go in, right? And you need to have the right skew. So if you, if let's say somebody is buying a Horlicks, uh, if, if you're typically buying, let's say 200 gram pack and what you, what the store has is only 500 gram pack. So if the product availability is poor, you, you probably would switch it to a 200, to 200 gram pack, or you would probably go and look for another store or, you know, you would go on, you might even do a brand switch, right? So a lot of these things could happen. There are statistics to say, you know, what behavior happens and what uh, kind of, uh, you know, shopping environments, right? If you look at a sh if you look at a retail, even the smallest of the stores would easily carry 20 to 30,000 SKUs, right? And some of the retailers we work with are working with easily 200,000, 300,000 SKUs. So given that environment, it's humanly impossible with so much of data coming in that unless you mesh all the different pieces of data and you said to drive what's your principal agenda for the year, right? Like Amrita said, we have been, we had a COVID impact and we see that impact in the sales of different formats of retailer, right? And you see the patterns from last March till now, right? There is a growth in sales, there is a drop in sales, there is a recovery. You you see all kind of things and it's a very, this is a very dynamic world, both retail and consumer brands. Are. It's both dynamic and it's very noisy data where you can easily mistake and make decisions and which is, we call it dismal signs, rightly so, because you got to make decisions without knowing what is going to be right. So I would run a promotion as a retailer or a consumer brand like a consumer brand under a train promotion and assuming that it's going to lift your sales, but you might end up having the same level of sales, but you don't know whether if you're not done a promotion, what would have happened? Back to you, Vijay and Suresh. Thank you, Raj. I think uh, by now we have a very good backdrop of what uh, and how we need to manage this issue of digital transformation. I would actually like to put a triangle in front of you. There is digital transformation, which is the end goal. And one of the accelerator to that is digital experience. And definitely both converge to serve the people. When we talk about people, I have two types of audiences, uh, one on the consumer side, and the other, the internalized adoption oblique implementation side. So this is broadly the sandbox that we are looking at with regard to digital transformation, digital experience, and the people quotient in the retail fabric of things. Tools 
and so many other things with which we can massage the data and present it in the way in which we want to understand it it all is great but i think the gap between technology adoption usage and benefits particularly among the consumer side of the story is quickly closing the customer was always distanced between the technology used by the retailer per se only to the extent of paying the bill or swiping the card but now i think not only because of covid and other external consideration even a brick and mortar shopper is now comfortable in looking at if the shop is open if the if they are carrying the right product or not then there are the other guys from augmented reality and virtual reality jump into this whole fray so i think overall uh, the experience component is vastly improving thanks also to mobile technology which has been a singular accelerator in this whole thing because very very dramatically uh, people have adopted mobile not just a device to make and receive phone calls today it's uh, it's our life so i think it's only a matter of time in any case resistance is only to be expected but i think it's getting weaker as we go by so i see down the line uh, fantastic things happening there's no doubt about that we can talk about uh, singular experiences uh, as gain in different types of verticals within the retail industry my conclusion would be overall is thank you this is a great insight some of you might have seen in on linkedin my current bug there is definitely customer experience many of these companies which are going into dx peers to me they don't seem to understand the need for putting the customer up front and running your entire dx exercise outside in and i keep saying this all about people is about the customer the employees the vendors partners etc etc and i'll use a previous example from some days back here's this bank with a credit card which i happen to own i'm trying to change the permissions on the card through a chatbot the chatbot asks me for my phone number which i provide and it bounces back saying i can't accept a numeric answer so it's not really about technology it's a lot about people it's a lot about consumer experience as well what is it that you feel what your human intent is I'd love to hear a little bit about this from madhubita and vivek because both of you have done retail type of work directly out and vivek you and i keep talking about our conversation about mangoes and ice cream and understanding people and how you sort of formulate how you use data how you use what the rest of the ecosystem is to target a particular customer to be able to satisfy his or her need maybe we could start from there and other with that you pick up that's interesting that you ask so ask and you you mentioned mangoes of all the things this is the right season for hapus yes, of course so alfonso is all around and it uh, it takes me back to the time when we were running a startup company in uh, fresh fruits and branded fresh fruits and vegetables you know it's a very on the face of it it just looks like a very simple business but it's actually quite a complex business you're dealing with about 100 skus uh, that's about the normal you buy them you source them 365 times a year you price each sku actually every day and the shelf life of each of these products you know a palak will live at best two days whereas onion and potato may live much longer but usually two to four days is what they will last now you have to sit and forecast correctly if you under forecast you lose sales and if you over forecast you just make losses the the vegetables they just become unusable unsellable so we were dealing with this complexity and we had cool rooms and we were supplying to our customers what we learned was that the factors which were required for forecasting the uh, quantity they were also outside our control for example the nicest one is this barish ho gayi pakode ban gaye pakode ban gaye gobi got consumed the demand for gobi picked up now i had not planned for so much of cauliflower what did i know that it's going to rain and that will drive up my cauliflower but if i had correlated and i can see the prediction that there is likelihood of rain and that usually drives up potatoes onions and cauliflowers i could have built it in into my forecast what we realized was that no matter how much we tried the linear forecasting models they were very very difficult to yield acceptable levels of accuracy and what we what we needed was some ai based uh, forecasting system 
which would incorporate external factors. For example, in this case, the local weather. And this weather is different for Pune, it's different for Mumbai, and it is different for Delhi. So you have to do local level of forecasting, incorporating an external factor like weather. So this was one of the huge learning. And honestly, if we had access to, uh, you know, a really powerful AI led forecasting model, I think we would have saved as much as maybe 15% of the total that was getting ordered. That's the level of wastage we could have controlled. So that's a, that's an experience that uh, we lived very closely for a long time. So yeah. I, I think uh, Vivek, you spoke about one very important aspect of this. So it's, it's about ensuring that the forecast is right so that you are able to go and supply, whether it's Palak, whether it's Kaliklas or whatever else to a particular city, particular bunch of stores. And this is where DX actually comes into play when you start integrating technology, integrating the consumer need, consumer experience, which means that I need to be able to figure out what my weather is going to be like in Delhi versus in Pune, which means that I'm looking at, let's say Google weather. I need to be start looking at arranging for different kinds of fresh produce, which will go in with different types of shelf life, which means I need to go and ping my supply chain at the back end and ensure my supply chain is synced slightly away. And it's not everything as, as if the potatoes and onions and, and spinach, all of them arrive at the same time because they might or might not get consumed. They might, might get spoiled, which also means that I need to pick back. And if it's regular other FMCG, non, non-fresh, non-food type of FMCG, I need to pick back to my backend production for that to start working, which also means if there's a non-fresh food, an FMCG company, which is starting to produce two, three different kinds of, let's say a wheat based company, which is making suji, which is also making sevai, which is making pasta, depending on the kind of seasons, depending on the kind of demographic in a certain area, even inside a city, I need to be able to have a supply chain, which is reading off data, the production, which is reading off the data and is bringing this asynchronous set of packets into different people. So has the, you know, my, my one other point that I wanted to share with all of you is that we started out small like any startup and then we grew. Initially, we were able to do the forecast. Very soon, we realized that it was beyond us to be able to do any normal Excel-based linear sort of forecast. So it was too staggering a task. And we realized like unless we use technology and use it really well, there is no way we could have succeeded. Even your example of, you know, uh, you know, being able to supply to clusters within the city for products which have longer uh, shelf life. In our case, we had products which had two to four days of shelf life and we had 365 occasions to actually price them because every day the price of vegetables changes. So the task was too much for us to not to be able to do it without using technology. And that was really a staggering feeling. You feel small and you think that, you know, you really need a lot of help to be able to be successful. Indeed, you just touched upon uh, scientific pricing. That's that's one point that I had missed out. How do you not be able to price it differently and make slight, slight corrections as, as you're going along? Okay, let, let me uh, take this to Amrita now. So in an FMCG world, uh, rather corporate FMCG world, Amrita, and you started talking about it just a while back, we are looking perhaps at a situation where there are many, many small cottage industry type FMCG players coming up. I know of a bunch of people who have started to make pickles, people who have started to make nutraceuticals from a very small workshed. All of these people now are on Flipkart or Amazon or any of these other platforms. Similarly, there are other smaller players who are starting to get on places like Uran, for example. And I'm also trying and uh, picking up a question which is already there. How does it really work? What kind of pressure does it put on a regular FMCG corporate organized FMCG player now in terms of DX actually? Yeah, absolutely, Suhas. I think it's uh, a very pertinent question. Uh, I would say till date, it was just about, you know, losing share, but now it's going to be about survival. And moving forward the next couple of decades, I, I don't think it's going to be uh, easy at all for companies, for brands to really chase growth, to chase uh, bottom lines, uh, all of that. Now, I think what's very interesting to note is what these startup brands have done very interestingly is that they have 
touched the consumer core, you know, as you said, from an experience perspective, if you look at. And the way I see it is from two perspectives. One is from a product innovation perspective, whatever were the consumer need gaps, which were genuine need gaps. So if you talk about uh, naturals, if you talk about the space of plant-based, uh, you know, solutions which are good for the environment, so which are sustainable, brands which are purpose-led, I think all of this today, what we or any of the large corporations, large brands are talking about is sort of an inspiration in part by the startup revolution. And that's more from the product innovation perspective. Now, also, I think when you look at the business model perspective, I think that's where the maximum impact again has hit large brands. Why? Because it's a transition from mass consumerization, which is the forte of you know, large brands and FMCG companies to getting into mass consumer personalization. And mass consumer personalization is actually fueled by data and technology. And in ways which is actually leading to today what we see, or rather in the last one year, what we've seen, the start of the whole, I would say diversity and inclusion uh, emphasis. And I'm not just talking about gender diversity, but technology is becoming an enabler for good for including all classes and all masses of the society in multiple ways. So a very simple example, the food that you were talking about that we eat, uh, and some of these startup brands have done that so well, they have actually done a complete end-to-end -end traceability across the supply chain. So I actually, when I'm consuming a pasta, I can know that which farmer in which part of the country today has actually grown you know, the wheat that was used in that pasta or uh, the, the millets that were used in that pasta. And this, I think, is, is truly fascinating, you know, because it, it, and that's how I say it links back to diversity and inclusion, because we also know sitting here in a metropolitan city, who is that one person in which village? And also we can talk about his per capita income. And we feel proud as a consumer that if I consume more of this brand of pasta, I'm going to be contributing to the lower SECs and enabling India also, you know, to sort of progress in a very, very interesting way. At the same time, contribute to doubling farmer incomes. So you see, we are talking about diversity and inclusion in a way which is extremely exponentially growing because of the use of digital technology and the whole customer and consumer experience process. So I think there are, you know, multiple examples like these across FMCG categories. This was an example of foods and beverages. And then, you know, if you look at uh, other industries, other categories as well, there are several examples that can be spoken about. Lovely, that. Thanks, so, Amrita. Okay, well, so if, I, if I may, sorry, if I may change your uh, conversation a little bit, let's, yeah. let's talk about a little bit more about people from where Amrita was going. In my mind, at least, and, and Feel free to opine whichever way. DX digital transformation is not just a cluster of point solutions, right? It's not about just doing a little bit of AI here, a little bit of data analytics there. Oh my God, everybody's on cloud today, so let's, let's go on cloud. But it's about gutting an organization. It's about reimagining the way you do business, reimagining the way you think about a customer, consumer, et cetera, right? So may, maybe if you could give us a sense of that. Okay, so uh, I, I would, I'll give you an example and a sense, but not so much from the teaching point. I'll pick up both what you've talked about now, Suhas, and connect it to what we were discussing a while back. Now, if you were to look at the people angle and DX as an entity, and uh, speaking about the mango example, what Vivek was mentioning, now it's very interesting. While retailers work on various forecasting models and replenishment models, uh, the constant struggle has been dealing with the bugbear called ooze or out of stock. And the other bugbear, which my FMCG friends uh, are partially also uh, rather wholly responsible, is fill rates. Yeah, so be it the largest FMCG company or the smallest, despite the most advanced forecasting techniques, etc., available to us today, some way or the other, things go wrong. Just to pick up from what Vivek mentioned about seasonality. Now, when we do a replenishment or a forecast, forecasting uh, for uh, sales and projection, we look at invert, we look at our existing data. Now, there is also external data, like very rightfully mentioned. Now you look at the seasonality and the weather changes, 
in a certain region it cannot be that it's monsoon across the country look at seasonality look at festivities for example uh, now sevaiya sees a spike during ramzan now that is not across now when i look at a large retail uh, organization running some 500 600 stores it can't be that we spike up sevaiya forecast across the country even within a city to take a city like bangalore now there are pockets where it could go up there are pockets where it wouldn't look at festivities look at events ipl and potato chips have a very very symbiotic uh, relationship look at these and put these into the forecasting uh, model rather than look at only your own sales data now this is something which technology has been helping but there's a long way to go and to bring the people angle here if i uh, half my life is spent in the back end uh, merchandising so i have headed merchandising buying and merchandising functions across various organizations now it's again the people and the reluctance of people be it the youngsters or the middle management the reluctance to adapt technology because they feel that the sense of power which they have their expertise their experience and knowledge is taken away from them so that is the gap which needs to be bridged and not so much rely on gut feel and in my experience this is what happens and uh, amrita uh, you must be dealing with retailers i'm sure you would have heard the phrase oh mujhe pata hai this is the way it happens that's the way it happens yeah so technology and dx can play a big role here now just to uh, continue on the same thread and picking up what vijay mentioned uh, before i had this tech trouble about ar and vr now i'll share an example from the beauty industry where beauty advisors are essential to sell products like makeup and high end skin care and this is something which is typically seen in india alone you don't see that in southeast asia you don't see it in western world where consumers are fully aware so it could also be a factor of cheap labor in our country so beauty assistants are essential for sales be it the large fmcg companies or the smaller fmcg now the fallout of this over dependence on beauty advisors is that small brands tend to struggle to make a mark in uh, retail organizations this is where your technology can come to the aid of not only all brands kind of uh, democratizing things it can also help the retailers uh, you know reduce their dependence on this beauty uh, advisors because that's a whole chapter altogether so there are uh, tools like magic mirrors you know makeup mirrors where you can look at that as an alternate to beauty advisor suggesting ki ye lipstick shade aapke skin pe suit karega so you have you know skin testing devices lot of brands have started using this lot of retailers have started adapting to this so that we kind of not do away with the people part of it we do not kind of look at uh, treating technology as something of an enemy but trying to bridge both so this is where retailers and brands need to work uh, hand in hand trying to ensure that technology is adapted wholeheartedly to improve the consumer experience like rightly mentioned by most of you that consumer needs to be at the heart of anything whether it is a retailer uh, uh, enterprise or whether it's an fmcg suvash so i have an interesting anecdote to pick on uh, so this is a leading uh, fmcg player in india okay at the start of the covid uh, they had a sudden spike in their healthcare portfolio right the sudden spike is so much right this is a business which has been there for ages together and you know in and out of seasonality trends what happens when not a pandemic of this size but what happens when things something like this happen right but the spike was so high they lost about close to 25 to 27% of the sales estimated sales right they didn't have a chance they didn't have stock at the root to the market at the chance they they couldn't you know refill the uh, shelves at the retail outlets they were serving so you step back there is an interesting uh, i think new site i that panasonic buys blue yonder Right, so Blue Under is essentially a firm you'd all be familiar with. Uh, is earlier JD Anderson, which provides a retail a point of sale and retail merchandise management and all of those. They actually acquired uh, I2, the supply chain planning solution, before even SAP and Oracle got into the space. Blue Under guys were doing exactly what Vivek and Madhumita were saying, doing forecasting with multiple variables, right, so that you can get to reasonably accurate levels. So, so somebody like Tesco has Uh, product availability, or in supply chain parlance, the product fill rates about 92 to 95 percent at the store level, not at the individual SKU or a particular division or a category level, right? You you translate that to a very large retailer in India, 
the product availability falls to about 62%. That means about you are losing sales in about 30 to 40% of the cases uh, if the product, if a customer has come in looking for a sale. In an e-commerce world, you know what the customer intent is because the customer comes and looks at a, a particular page and bounces back because there is no stock. But in a real retail world, you only know what is sold. What we see as best practices in domains are even a basic forecasting models. Even we're talking about the most advanced retailers in India, for that matter, anywhere in Asia and even the world. They're all, most of them are still running, whether it is a retailer or whether it's a consumer brands. So they all manage the product availability problem by overstocking. If I'm a large consumer brand, what will I do? I'll throw a lot of stock, whether necessary or not, whether it sells or not, into the channel and push it so hard and try to run a promotion so that there is an offtake at the outlet level. So that is our product availability problem at the channel is managed by a brand. In a retail, you will always have a limited space. So the guy shuffles around and many retailers don't have a very scientific manage of managing even the planograms. The planogram discipline in India, we believe has to be a lot more better. And not only I say most of the brands because they all have special aisles, they, they pay for the aisles and they don't see a planogram discipline the retailers follow. Uh, in addition to that, you know, they don't have the right products queue available there. So you say this particular brand and that particular product category should be there at this particular shelf space. It is not there. They tend to refill with some, some other brand. So you, you might end up losing the thing, right? So what we suggest to the, both the retailers and consumer brands slightly differently is first is we say first sense the demand trend, right? So if, if there is a trend of a particular demand pattern, whether it is a brand switching, whether it is a size switching or pack size switching, Right. Sometimes it could be across category switching, like what happened in a, uh, in a fashion retail in this uh, in this uh, last year or so. Right. So sense a sense a demand pattern shift first, consumer behavior pattern shift first, and second thing is get run campaigns which are much more effective. That's what Amrita was also talking about, hyper personalized campaigns. Right. Today, unfortunately, all of us, including the panelists, receive campaigns which we don't click and move on and do a purchase. Right. It, it reflects poorly in terms of the data they used, the underlying approach they used. So that's what Amrita was talking about. How do we do mass personalizations? Mass personalization to the extent of even just 50 people, very targeted for the particular assortment, which they would find it relevant to come to the store and buy. Right. And once you solve this, then you got to get your things. And current kind of systems, unfortunately, is not going to meet up with this kind of demands. Thanks, Raj. And uh, let me come back to Am Amrita because we were talking about this and after that, maybe Vijay, yep. you could talk a little bit about technology in terms of, you know, the example that I keep using is today, a bank can actually get online, get ready from zero to all the way operational in less than 30 APIs. The 30 APIs can happen only if essentially you go on some sort of a cloud and you start not competing, but cooperating with people. So Vijay, if you could take that just after Amrita's uh, done with that point of view. Sure. So uh, I was just taking a cue from what Raj and Marinita mentioned, and uh, there were two interesting things I wanted to say. So as Raj was talking about, you know, the whole conundrum that we see at the retail outlet in India, and as we know, most of India is largely unorganized in retail. So I'm sure, you know, you would have read a lot about e-commerce, but one statistic that actually took me by, I would say, surprise completely is that India is actually, when it comes to organized chain retail sales, e-commerce is driving up the penetration of chain retail sales and making it more organized in India to the tune that we are the third largest in terms of our online to offline sales ratio of chain retail sales. And it's as high as 43%, which only China and second one is China is about 74%, Nigeria is 50%, we are 43%. And neither do you see a US or a UK or any of the other developed markets that are there. That really speaks about, you know, what is the new age business model for FMCG brands? And some of the challenges that Raj was highlighting in terms of the concerns that we have for these smaller brands, which never get visibility uh, in the eyes of the consumer because the shelf space is so crowded, that's where the opportunity is for these digital native, digital first, e-com first kind of brands. And on the other hand, connecting back to what uh, Madhumita said, you know, that uh, the whole beauty industry, in fact, it's an expertise which was created by the FMCG world that these beauty advisors were able to drive conversions. Similarly, in the healthcare industry also, 
we see that you know it's those advisors or uh, you know the the medical detailing uh, toolkit and uh, the representatives who are who are driving uh, more awareness education and conversion now what the whole digital startups space did is took both these capabilities from long standing players which is the healthcare companies as well as nutrition companies and fmcg companies it was their forte and just digitized it and created three large categories online which are one amongst the largest across the world so when you look at baby and child care india is definitely you know online leading the pack when you look at health tech and the way some of the interesting startups have you know created that mass personalized experience through these online advisors again is world class and you have you know global investors investing in india's health tech uh, kind of creation that's happening and the third one is also the fashion influencers so i think a lot of the capabilities that large brands and fmcg companies have are being taken up by these digital first native brands and they are creating a full business model from end to end i just wanted to say that in response to many of the points made by all people first i want to make a a small observation that our discussion so far has been largely store centric and supply chain centric uh, at some point of time i think we need to address the dx part of it uh, while we all accept and agree that the digital transformation is very essential not just for survival management and growth right uh, in this context one of the exemplary implementations that i have come across in the most recent times is swiggy which started out as a typical mobile app which in the hyper local sense could put food on your table of course you have to pay for it but at the end of the day they kind of broad based themselves particularly if you look at the swiggy insta mart side of their operations the ability with which you could procure a singular item no matter how low the value quickly enough in all probabilities in less than 2 hours while they haven't started giving any uh, time guarantees as yet but i would say that this is a rich implementation of digital experience oblique digital transformation that is being witnessed in our times back office guys will continue to do their part whether it is to improve the fill rates or if they are not limited too much by the logistics availability of wagons <coughs> and other things what amuses me is couple of years back digital anything in retail was the punching bag of the doyens of the brick and mortar industry they were hostile uh, they said that this should go and this is eating into our way of doing things etc but somehow uh, an unfortunate incident like covid made everything turn it on its head so much so that even the government is now relaxing the fdi rules and the like while the politics part of it and the implementation part of it will go on but i think we all may have to agree that the e-commerce is here to stay and is going to continuously enrich our lives a lot of people even in our day to day life people are even thinking will we really get back to the office or are we comfortable now in our work from home concept etc there is uh, a digitalization for you so it has made so many things happen so i i don't see any reason uh, why it's going to why it won't get more entrenched and well anchored presence but i think all people vendors uh, service <coughs> providers technology enablers and the like would only uh, like to look at the cons- consumer public customer part of the uh, equation a little bit more in their own selfish interest obviously so us sorry if i can just make a point uh, what vijay say triggered uh, something that i saw happening in front of me in in one of the industries that i worked in which is vision care and the the standard way of getting pecs which was essentially the way people corrected their vision was to go to the store and you know uh, get your eyes tested and test the frame and then if you like it you just bought it and then i don't have to name the company and i will i would expect that all of you would be able to name the company which came along and said that you sit at home 
I'll be able to test your, and you can try the specs. If you like it, I will just send it to you. And if it doesn't work, I'll take it back from you. Your customized specs from the comfort of your room, after they have tested your eyes, initially they even sent a person to test your eyes with, with an equipment which was able to work at your home, which was mobile. And then eventually they said that the phone itself can test the eyes. And we saw that transformation initially when it came about, everybody was completely not trusting it. And the industry was up in arms saying that, you know, it's not going to work. It's going to lead to problems, this, that, and the other. Where are we today? Lenskart is very much here. So the industry itself is changing. And it changed because of the adoption of technology first by the company and then by the consumer. And the quality of consumer experience has gone up. People are happy. I think Vivek, it it's also has to do, do with, or rather, rather what we're talking about in a, in a different way or different fashion, is the fact that the disruptions which are coming into the market from the newer players, besides anything else, are putting a huge amount of pressure onto the existing organized retail organized FMCG players for them to change, change in the way they work, change in the way they look at customers, change in the way they do their business. Even, even simple things like perhaps if you happen to have a customer, potential customer visiting your website, you should be able to figure out where this customer is from, where what the base demographics are. And you can pick all that from the browser today. And you should be able to say, for example, even if the person is from Assam, you should be able to say a few days, few days back, which should the person for view. Or if the person is from Punjab, hopefully is a, is a Punjabi who celebrates Baisakhi, you should be able to wish in, in specificity. So now, now with that, there are a couple of questions which I'll pick up quickly. Is the technology intervention required at the time of inception only? So I'm assuming you're talking about uh, digital Start transformation. Up. So no, it's, it's not about inception only. It's not about when you set up only. Digital transformation is not a project. It is not a, a program which, which ends over a period of time. It's a journey. It's a way you of mind. Yeah, it's a way of life. You might run different programs and you just keep keep moving from them. So I would uh, add a point to what you said uh, to answer also that question. I think it's very interesting. I like this question a lot because, uh, you know, being uh, I've seen this across large brands. Even if we want to make a small change, it becomes extremely difficult because the whole, you know, value chain across various functions, the larger the setup, obviously the more challenging. And therefore, I think uh, this question also means that even when you're thinking about launching, introducing, getting into the market, I think keeping the fact that it has to be technology led is, is the ultimate because otherwise you desi don't design for technology or don't design for digital, which is a blunder according to me. Absolutely. So the question which comes up, what are the top three outcomes which you expect technology to enable? Allow me to change that question a little bit. Not talking about technology as such, but, but DX. The outcomes for DX, as far as I, I understand or I, as I practice, it's people orientation, right? So yeah, as you are doing people orientation, you're looking at an increased amount of customer orientation, people orientation. What does that do? I think there's only one particular pertinent outcome, that's growth. And people, I've seen many of my clients, customers, other associates ask, oh, how about taking care of cost? How about taking care of optimization? Sure, all that happens. All that happens in that journey. But what you are wanting to really look at, make happen, is that growth. I'm Can I also make a point, and I think uh, I would be happy to get reactions from all of you. I think what it also does is it future readies the organization. If I don't transform today, I'm lagging even more. And there should, there might be a time when the distance between what I should be and where I am becomes too much to cover. The journey becomes too difficult and arduous. I don't know how you would react to that. I can just add something here. Uh, Okay, Amrita, you have a point or should I just go ahead? Yeah, I was just saying actually, uh, so Vivek and Raj, I think as you said, uh, what it also enables, which I've seen personally happening, 
so this is again an observation that you know uh, there were certain ways of doing marketing when it comes to several industries whether it's healthcare whether it's fmcg you know there were certain designed protocols if i can so to say call them though they are not called like that in the actual world but it was very set even now it's quite set in the mind okay if i have 100 rupees to spend i would do you know 40% allocation here 30% here la, 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 la. so it's like a set you know kind of a model i think what this also enables us to do and because we are forcing sort of people to change to think to incorporate digital as part of everything uh, is that it challenges an individual as well you know to to sort of it's not just the organization and because people and employees make up the organization it's challenging people to challenge themselves and to accept that yes even after 40 years of working i will fail today because i don't know this new world so it gives a realization check it it sort of gives that ability to accept that you know there are other people younger people who who will know what to do when to do how to do and they will guide me and i have to accept that i think it does that very beautifully now taking a cue from all all the speakers about what and why the digital transformation is essential now i liked what vivek mentioned that i mean it's becomes a matter of survival there are certain organizations where the adaptation to newer technology and more so from a retail context uh, to look at omni channel as a strategy today i think it's common agreement that it is no longer a luxury it's a necessity uh, from the organization perspective from the consumers perspective now the pandemic situation i think has accelerated the adoption to omni channel by at least 5 years if not more there are retail organization where the online portion of the business was in single digits 5 6 7% those organizations have today seen it go up to as high as 30% and what probably the entire team behind these organizations should have been doing earlier but somehow they have been kind of tossing the ball around and not willing to accept that online is here to stay the gen z is some uh, is more familiar with online than offline and it's a mix of both which has to work i'll just narrate a small story here now there's this large behemoth retail very very respected very very old organization across the country they have stores now they are obviously online they're not yet about their act right now if you place an order common sense would say that since they have some hundreds of stores across aggregate the inventory of the stores as well as the warehouse and then see which which is the best alternate to serve the consumer give an example of bangalore now if i am a consumer who orders uh, online from this retailer now what i ended up receiving was five different orders from five different stores now it would have made more sense for them to aggregate it and then send it across look at the kind of cost who is looking at that you know so from a consumer experience it was most irritating because for a single order i have to kind of receive it five times from an organization perspective it's just waste down the uh, drain i mean there's so much of cost which has gone down the drain so these are the kind of adaptation which uh, needs to be done to ensure that you are not left behind tomorrow there's uh, a new a digital native uh, brand which will come and then draw your consumers away from you and that's something which i think the realization has started drawing upon uh, most of the uh, larger i would say offline uh, retailers and that's why omni channel now is becoming increasingly the crux of the game completely madam it i I, th- i think it also has to do a little bit with with the question which i i just read out you answered that partly i think this is just on your own how will dx accelerate in today's geopolitical situation so yeah that's absolutely that and also that, i don't know what the political situation but at least our current situation yeah there is a whole bunch of pressure on supply chain in terms of base retail operations in, even in terms of it operations where you can't get people to go and stand in front of a machine in a server room or, or stuff like that so making all that remote being able to get people to work from home how else will you do it and unless you were to be excel which yeah. i i interrupted yeah. why don't you take a shot and then i'll yeah. wrap up with a kind of a couple thanks, of questions which are from thanks, thanks to us in fact uh, we spent all of our time today in looking at the positive aspects of the digital transformation dx digital experience and the like but i would also like to respectfully submit that 
a, a digital transformation is not a panacea. It's not going to be the cure all of all our uh, friction points in the various processes and the fundamental flaws that we have. And even giants have known to fail. Like for example, I just want to put a small example. I have to use the name. You can consider it like a case study if you wish. I'm sure you all are familiar with Walmart. I'm talking about Walmart superstores in the US. Huge. The, the store itself is like a warehouse. I mean, you can you you will definitely not cover more than 15% of the floor space at any given point of time, even if you have all the time in the world. So they do two things. The first thing is they have to employ video analytics as heat seeking devices in order to see what is the pattern of the shoppers, which aisles, which shelves are getting maximum attention. There are areas where people don't even bother to go. So they quickly do a repro of the planogram and try and put items in stock in an optimal way so that people will automatically find their way across. Second thing, the failure part, which Walmart did was they tried uh, self checkouts, which has been a complete disaster. Now, on the other hand, Amazon is claiming that their Go stores are super efficient. You just walk in, you, you have a Gmail ID, you are a, a Google uh, participant in some way, you shop, you take whatever you want, put it in your cart, and you go away. That's it. It goes to you through your Google Pay to their payment is made. No human intervention whatsoever. But this is a guarded experiment. And we, we also have to look at various other societal things into it. The earlier question of Suhas was the outcome related to, uh, you know, political and many other situation. So I'm bringing in the societal element. Am I honest enough to pay for what I take and uh, uh, go away is also a real question. But I think the journey continues because this will continue to go evolve, experiment, make mistakes. That's OK. That's part of the game and reinvent and put in place things which will only make all our lives a lot better. Only, so only care, yeah. yeah, I just only want care. to add you know, a point here. I think one point which somewhere we as I would say as an industry, you know, need to really evolve uh, to enable digital transformation and something that uh, we haven't discussed till, till now. I, and I think it's very, very important is that if you really look at uh, you know the the e-commerce players in our country so like for traditional retail we do get a lot of data to crunch but when it comes to e-commerce in india we don't have something like a digital shelf analysis or any kind of analytics we don't get the data from the e-com players in india but the same players outside india have a complete module of you know detail related all analytics information and that's how uh, you know some of the other markets which are not even developed markets are able to actually utilize all the detail analytics to be able to sort of create a pseudo i would say a model which is very similar to traditional retail and that is an area of improvement because without that we will not be able to milk all the rich information and understand the digital shelf the digital consumer the behavior the usage all of that well absolutely everything and i think that's very very important I'm using one of the questions later to a uh, sort of opine. You're right also because you know, we are getting to a situation, getting to one slice of the economy for all practical purposes, which does not believe in basic profit and loss. We are talking about a sector of the economy which is working just off valuations. So it doesn't matter what amount of loss it is making as long as the valuation keeps going up and as long as the investor money is going on coming in, it, it is okay to run. So the question was about other business basics and not just technology, not just DX. But yeah, that, that's true. So if we are not figuring out what the customer really is doing, what the base data is, of course it becomes very different. My slight difference of opinion there was this, that people are starting to look at this valuation now, rather than whether base revenue versus profit is actually working or not. There's one more question I'll, I'll quickly take. So there's a question from Apoor Bhukta. He's asking about the average budget required for a large retail company to do DX. You know, I'll, I'll, you are a consultant, Apoor, that's, that's what your designation says here. And I'll give you a very consultant-like answer as well. 
The answer is depends. It depends because it depends on the size of your company, size of the reach that this retail brand has. But at, at a generic, very touristic type of uh, number, perhaps one should start considering between two and three percent of overall revenue to be expended for ATX in the first some number of years. I, I don't know what that number will turn out to be, and obviously there will be a little bit of a difference given what size of the company, what can I reach, and so on. Yeah. I think one fundamental thing we should underscore to the audience, all of us having been through some or other forms of digital and non-digital transformation, is that transformation by definitions are not guaranteed success. Right? There is enough studies being done by Bain to make him see to everybody in the transformation space. So he's saying significant of number of the transformation don't succeed in delivering the results. But like Vivek said earlier, without transformation, you have no runway going forward. Right? You're going to lose your market share. You cannot go to reinvent, especially if you're the leader of the pack. You've got to be setting trends in terms of how the experience is going to be, how the shoppers are going to be addressed, how they're going to be communicated to and all of those. So allow me to make one final comment on this. And I agree with you, Raj. So I keep saying this to all my clients and associates. When you think about DX, please think of it as a larger transformation for the company. And you're right, only about 16%, and I repeat, 16% of DX efforts actually succeed. That's an abysmal number in many, many cases because of two, three reasons. Either the support is not directly there from the high CXO level or because they have not considered it as a whole because the strategy roadmap is not made and people start collating together point solutions. I'd like to take time to thank each one of you. Amrita, you. Vizel, Raj, Vivek, Madhumita has been lovely. Thank you for being here. Thank you, your audience, for being patiently uh, listening, asking questions. Hopefully, you have gotten what you wanted from this session as well. That brings us to a close. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you, Suhas. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.